Welcome back. Now, these were the points that we were trying to drive out in the first half, in the first half of this message. And these were the points that we brought out, actually. Was, let me summarize them. Number one, Noah was saved from the greatest disaster in the history of the world before, because he found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Number two, what did he do to find this grace? Number three, if Noah was in a contemporary world, what kind of man would he be? Number four, will he, will he be like one of the gifted preachers with mega churches who can pack a crowd and fill a stadium with their oratory? Or will he be like Mother Teresa who abandoned all the luxuries of life and gave her everything to help the poor. What was the, what was the merit or the demerits of Noah that made him qualify to find grace when everyone else was killed? If he was living among us today, will it be someone who never cursed, who never got angry, who never gossiped, who never had one fried chicken too many in, on the dinner table, what would qualify him to have escaped the disaster that was worse than the worst tornado, worst tsunami, worst earthquake? What was it that made him qualify? The only thing that I saw that Noah did was that he made up his mind to take God at his word. When God created the world, he said it was good. And God never repent what he's done. So he took God at his word that the world was supposed to yield fruit. That the world, that God said, be fruitful and multiply, have dominion. And so he went back to the, the first intent of God. He believed in that first intent. He looked around him. It didn't go with the status quo. It didn't go with, it didn't just flow with the, with, the, with, the, with the stream of what was going on in the contemporary world. It decided that this that I'm seeing around me were better than this. And so when his heart was made up to seek God, God showed up. God showed up because Noah began to have godly fear. God didn't show up because Noah qualified. But God showed up because of Noah's faith. So now let's go to the definition of grace in the New Testament. In the in book of Ephesians. It said, Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8 to 9 says, By grace... You are saved through faith and not of yourself. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Every syllable there is important. By grace, you are saved. Salvation. And salvation is all inclusive. You can be saved from the flood, that's salvation. You can be saved from disease, that's salvation. You can be saved from poverty. That's salvation. Whatever is going on in your life at any moment, if you cry on to the Lord and you believe he can save you, yes, he will come to the scene and save you. But you've got to know that it's not of yourself. Because there was no way Noah could have saved himself from that flood. You've got to have that godly fear. And you've got to cry out. that I need help. That's when God shows up. Because this one is saying, it's not of yourself. So you can't boast about it. It's a free gift of God. Not of, your, of works, what you can do by yourself. Then it says, lest anyone should boast. That means there are some people, right at the recesses of their mind, they can still be trying to say, oh, I did this. I did that. And God is saying, no. When you get to the end of yourself, when you cannot say yes, oh, my MBA got me this. 
My MD got me this. My car got me this. My brain got me this. When you begin to now know that there is nothing, that there is a point in life in which certain things will happen to us, that not, nobody can save you. Maybe you've never been under a knife before. People that are going for surgery, when they begin to tell them all the things that can happen in surgery, and they don't even know when they put them to sleep, and they don't know when they wake up, that, that's when some people know that, yes, in fact, there are certain things that are beyond me. Maybe it's going to take that to make some people wake up. But it shouldn't take that. It should really be that we should begin to believe that God exists. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 11 that he that will come to God must believe that he is. Not he was. Not he will be. He is means is ever present. Present tense continuous ad infinitum. It's an eternally existing God all by himself. It doesn't need anything to exist. It just exists. And it radiates life. He is. And is a rewarder of those who are hungry for him. Those who diligently begin to seek him. When you begin to hunger for righteousness, the Bible called Noah a preacher of righteousness. He hungered for righteousness to the point that he began to preach righteousness. That there is a right relationship with God that exists out there. And he began to preach it long before the flood. That's what I believe happened. But nobody was listening to him. The problem was making fun of him. In the Hebrew chapter 11, they said Noah moved with fear. And built an ark. It had never rained. So they were looking at him as some crazy folk. Some crazy fellow. Because it had never rained. But the Bible says he moved with fear. It was a godly warning. It was something in the conscience. In his conscience that began to make him feel that something is wrong with what we are doing around here. Something is wrong with the way we are living. You know, you see, the Bible said in uh, um, in, in, the, in the book of Luke, it said, as in the days of Noah. Let me read that quickly. It said, this, the reason why most people totally forget God is everything looks good to them. Their car is working well. They don't, they're not hungry for any food. They are, they are in the richest nation on earth, like in America. So they don't think anything. They don't think they really need God. In fact, people, some people call dollar almighty dollar. So it's like the dollar is God. After all, why would anybody call a dollar almighty dollar? Comparing him to, to God. That's what I'm thinking. But look at what they said in Luke chapter 17, verse 26. They said, just as it was in the days of Noah, so also it will, be, it will be in the days of the Son of Man. People were eating, drinking, marrying, and being given in marriage. Up to the day Noah entered the ark. Then the flood came and destroyed them all. None of them had any inclination it was coming. Why? Because they were comfortable in their environment. That's what happens to us. We go to school, we get our degree, we're ha having life, we're living large, we go to the club, we have our martini rosé with our friends, they are like us, they are attorneys, they are doctors. Nothing is wrong with that because it's legal anyway. So that's what totally makes us insensitive to the Spirit of God. They said there was nothing wrong with what they were doing. So people were eating, drinking, marrying. And being given in marriage. That is cultural. Those are good things. There is no way anyone will, will, will frown at those things. But what those things can do to us is it makes us totally comfortable with, with our surroundings. And we don't, we don't feel that anything else is going on. But Noah, in the midst of all that, you see, there was no, what I just read to you, I mean, I can't smell any wickedness in this. Eating, drinking, marrying, being given in marriage. These are cultural, so, uh, contemporary things. 
But then, in the midst of that, Noah felt uncomfortable. That's, there's something wrong with this picture. And he began to build an ark. But they didn't recognize it. They didn't have godly fear. And they were destroyed. So let's go to the book of Hebrews that now talked about what Noah actually did. Because I like to read that, um, read that uh, slowly so that we can really understand what, what, what happened when Noah built the ark. The ark. In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 7, they said, By faith, Noah, when warned about things not yet seen, never had any flood, never had any rain, but he had some warning. Maybe he had a vision, maybe he had a dream, I don't know. But he had some divine warning. In holy fear, build an ark to save his family. By faith, he condemned the world and became heir of righteousness that comes by faith. So he believed that there was something wrong with the status quo. He began to seek God, and God showed up. In 2 Chronicles chapter 16, verse 9, God clearly showed us how he does this. The Bible says, the eye of the Lord goes to and fro, looking to show himself strong on the behalf of those who, whose heart is loyal or perfect towards him. What does that mean? That means God is just looking for a glimpse of faith, a flicker of faith from anyone. doesn't matter the race. It doesn't matter the height. It doesn't matter the sex. It doesn't matter the gender. It doesn't matter Wherever, where they were born, whether they were born rich, born poor, it doesn't matter to God. All he's looking for is someone with a flicker of faith, just an atom, an iota of faith in whatever is ever written in his word. And God will show up. And once he shows up the first time, he will show up again if you are grateful for what he's done the first time. So as we round this up, let us now go over what grace is and what it does for us. What is grace? It is the free or merited favor of God towards the undeserving and the ill-deserving. Ephesians chapter 2. Number 2, grace originates only from God and God only. Number 3, God gives grace to those who have come to the end of themselves. He gives grace to the humble, James chapter 4, verse 6. Number four, God gives grace to those who have come to believe that he is, that he, he exists and is a rewarder of those who consistently seek him. That's number five. God is consistently seeking for anyone who has come to the end of themselves or their self-effort and has purpose in their heart to turn towards him. Number six, God gives grace to those who has come to believe that is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Number seven, grace abounds only to those who are grateful for what God has done for them in the past. That's one part of grace that many people don't really understand. If God gives you grace in an area, be grateful. Give glory to him, not to yourself. I remember one of my sisters one day, a friend of hers came to, to her. And this friend is always having headaches. And then the friend comes, and, yeah, and then the friend gets headache, comes to her for Tylenol because she was a nurse, comes to her for Motrin, some pain reliever. And then one day, my sister got a bit upset. She said, and told this friend, why are you always having a headache? I've never had a headache ever in my life. Guess what happened? That same evening, she had a headache for the first time. Why? Because she boasted about the grace in, of God that God has given her in an area. So what we need to do if we have grace in any area is to give glory to the grace giver. 
no one, none of us can have any gift by ourselves. That's why it is said that it is a gift of God, not of yourself, lest no one can boast. Thank you for listening to us. I'm your host, Akin Ayeni, born again Christian, family physician, a servant of the Most High God. Until next time, we thank you for listening.